everyone, welcome back to the channel. Um, I've got here on my workbench a Grundig RF100, which is a simple tabletop radio from Grundig uh, from 1983. And um, when I say simple, I really, really mean really simple because it only has long wave, medium wave, and FM. And uh, this is the volume control, tone control, and the tuning. And that's it on the back. You only have an input for the antenna, and that's it. So it's really the bare minimum, and uh, this product was really on the low end of the range uh, from Grundig. I can show you in the catalog in a minute. But um, you have to keep in mind that um, in the 80s, the tabletop concept wasn't popular at all anymore uh, for radios. So people were buying uh, boomboxes, um, portable radios, uh, radios which had a cassette deck, uh, Walkmans, um, even the CD was quite new, but coming up. So in 1983, the, the tabletop concept, which really dominated the radio market in, let's say, the 50s and the 60s, was almost totally dead. Now, Grundig was still making some of these devices. They really... Yeah, maybe there was a niche market still for it, so they were still making them. But it's clear that they did it on a, <laughs> yeah, on a cost because it's made very simple. It's quite cheap. Everything is plastic. Um, so they did to try to not spend, yeah, to try to save as much as money on on, on that they had to spend on these de uh, designing these kind of uh, radios. Um, because I do believe that the chassis inside is reused from an older model and then the chassis is also again reused in some later models so they just redesigned the case uh, every couple of years and then that was it. Uh, now to show you that I do have here the catalog. So this is the uh, catalog of radios of Grundig 1983-1984. You can easily find these uh, catalogs on archive.org. Um, and if you look at it, really in the beginning, they start by showing off their flagship boombox. Um, and then another boombox. More boomboxes. Um, and then they start going into portable radios. And mainly notice that uh, these radios, they all have a cassette deck. What is happening with this PDF reader here? Why is it... Uh, notice that these all have cassette decks, and this one has doesn't. And this is really what you yeah, come to expect from 80s radios. And that's also what I remember that everybody who had a radio sitting at home, even it wasn't even it was in the kitchen and it was never um, only used in the kitchen and never taken outside of the house, it still was a, a portable radio that could in theory operate on batteries, even though Lots of people were not using that portable function. They still bought a radio which was portable and which had a cassette deck. Because why would you spend money on a device like this if you could have yeah, a thing like this which had much more functions? See, again, portable radios, Walkmans. And we really have to scroll very far ahead before we can find this... Um, um, tabletop the radio. Here we go into the professional range with the satellites. See the satellite. What is this? Which one is this? Four thousand. The satellite six hundred. Yeah. So mm, dee -dee -dee -dee. these are the. Now we come to the world receivers. This is the yacht boy. Da -da -dee. Let's continue. Still, this is a travel radio. So the small portable. Once here we are at the clock radio. So can you imagine that you have a serious radio product and that even the clock radios are ahead of you in the in the brochure? So that means that Grundig really didn't um, see much potential in this product. And then finally here we get to the tabletop radio. So there we have on the first page three models. Come on. Okay, so um, I just quickly rebooted the PDF reader. Um, there is. You see here this older model, the RF420, 
RF1100, this is the RF110, and then all the way in the bottom corner in a very small picture and in the last page of the brochure you have the RF100, so it's literally the last product of the brochure and they didn't even bother printing a decent picture, it's just like, like a postage stamp, uh, that small. After this you go into the accessories, so... <laughs> Um, now the difference between these three is that the RF110, so that's this guy, has presets and this one also has a clock and an alarm um, shoved into it because it's literally shoved in. It's really this space here where they just shove the clock in which is totally separate from the rest of the radio. Um, and then in the coming years they just again reuse the chassis with a different case style but honestly i do have to say that i do like this style of case um or cabinet how it looks it looks pretty modern for 1983 you don't expect a design like this from 1983 i mean if you would put a digital display in here and add a dab plus functionality then you can put this in a shop today, more or less, because yeah, DAB radios these days, they look like this. Um, it looks quite modern, actually. And that's why I do want to give this one a service, even though it's such a cheaply made and um, yeah, low-end radio. Um, the entire case is made out of plastic, and you can see over here there is a huge chunk missing. Um, on the foot of the base here, which I will not be able to repair, so it's not going to be a restoration. Here as well, here is a big crack, see, in the in the base, so I think maybe somebody must have dropped this radio at some point. This I could glue back, that's not a problem, but this obviously here I won't be able to do anything about that. So what is the ID? Um, now, I know that it works because I picked this up about a year ago and I tried it then and it worked. It, it didn't work perfectly fine. It had a couple of issues, but it worked. So we can just plug it in and see if it still works, but it should. Um, the idea is to yeah, give it a clean, obviously, and um, take it apart, give it a good service, repla replace all the capacitors um, and check if there was nothing wrong, um, do an alignment because that might also be necessary and um, then I'm gonna add Bluetooth to this radio. Now I know that a lot of you hate it, or not a lot, some of you hate it when I add Bluetooth to some vintage radios. Now I don't think you will blame me for adding Bluetooth to a radio like this. It's um, not really a valuable radio and it's in bad condition, well the case is damaged um, done to an extent that it cannot be repaired uh, anyway or restored anyway and it honestly it looks like a bluetooth <laughs> speaker so i think it might make sense to add bluetooth to this because then it can be used by someone um, i might give it away to a friend for example and it can be used as a sort of secondary kitchen radio for a while and it will have a lot more usage than with just fm because yeah, long wave and medium wave, they are dead here in Belgium. Um, so it's only FM which is useful. We have more and more radio stations which are moving to DAB or to internet streaming. So the FM will die out as well. Um, but I do think that this, it doesn't look too bad. It might fit in a modern home if it's cleaned up, obviously. And if it then has a Bluetooth functionality, then it really might get some use. So that's the idea here. Now let me plug it in and then I can show you if it still works. I think it still works. Where is the plug? The power lead is extremely stiff and very difficult to bend. But um, let me plug it in here. Okay, it's powered on, but uh, can you hear that? 
I don't know if you can hear it, but let me just take the microphone here closer to the speakers. Can you hear that buzzing? Now, I said speakers, but if there's only one speaker. Only here, I believe, is a speaker. This is just empty space. This is where they put the clock in the RF-1100. But can you hear this buzzing? Um, it's even there when the radio is turned off. So this radio, one of the things that I don't like about it, wait, let me just take my microphone back. Now, one of the things that I don't like about it is that it has a soft power switch. So it's never totally off. I can show it later in the schematic, but it, um, yeah, the, it, it basically activates a transistor which powers up the circuit. A part of the power supply circuit is always powered on, which does mean that it will have a bit of uh, standby uh, leakage or standby current. And um, you can now hear the buzzing through the speakers, and that's probably because of the electrolytics which are leaking, um, that um, you can hear some buzzing even though the radio is um, should be powered off. Now, let me show you if it still works. Um, I probably will have... I don't have an antenna connected, so... Um... Voilà. Now we have an antenna. Um, so yeah, it's working pretty well. This is... It also looks like it's okay because this uh, radio station is 99.9, .9, so let's say 100, and it looks like the uh, RF is aligned pretty well. See, this is uh, 97.9, so that's... Uh, Showing up on 98, which is also fine. Honestly, it plays quite well. I don't know if a big alignment will be needed. I don't think so, honestly. I'm just going... The capacitors do need to be replaced, I guess. I think the first step is opening this thing up and having a look at how it looks inside. Okay, so first thing we need to do to get this back panel off is remove two screws here. So, and they are here in these holes, rather deep inside. So I hope that um, I will be able to find them with my screwdriver. This. Yeah, that's one. It's even written on the back here that you need to remove the screws. These two screws if you want to remove the back panel. But um, they could have done a better job of guiding you to the screw because, <laughs> yeah, a bit fiddly. Anyway, they are out. No, they are not. Yeah, I think they are. Yes, they are out. Now this should come off. Um, hmm. See, there are two more screws here, but normally you shouldn't remove this. Voila, there we are. It just comes off like this. Okay. Right. Um. Oh, we already have a repair here. See? This was repaired at some point, so I think someone dropped this radio uh, at a certain point during its life, um, seeing how the case is cracked and how this um, is glued back here. Um, then they say you should unplug the... Because I do have here the service manual and they have a short description on how to take it apart. Then they say you should unplug the power transformer. Now, I do have it unplugged from the mains. Yes, I do. So, 
you have to unplug this guy and we have the back panel removed now you can see that we have a ah okay this antenna was not um, connected so we have an internal antenna here very crude one and this was not plugged into the antenna socket so we didn't have an antenna at all the goal is that you plug this into that socket probably let's just put this aside for a second okay now i do have a date here uh, let me show you or bring it a bit closer um 60487 and this radio is from um 83 so this might have been repaired at some point especially this is definitely a repair all right now they do give you inst instructions on how to take this further apart, but I'm not convinced that this will be needed. If I can... Because... Ah, uh, yeah, it might be if I want to able to access everything in the PCB here. Well, the next step, they say, is that you should remove five screws. So that's probably these guys. One, two, three, four, and five. Um... And remove the knobs on the front and then you should be able to remove the chassis and desolder the speaker well let me just have a look at what we got here clean this up a bit because there is quite a bit of dust and there is also a broken piece of plastic laying here um, and then uh, i will get back to the video okay so the noise that you're hearing in the background probably that's my electric heater because it's bloody cold in here so i decided to leave it on for the video I'm sorry about that, I hope you forgive me, <laughs> but it's really cold here. So, um, I uh, took uh, off the knobs um, and now I'm just going to take out these five screws so that I can take the chassis out. I think that'll work a lot better oh, yeah. than um, having to bother with this plastic uh, cabinet, which there is always a possibility that you crack it. So, let's just take out the chassis. It'll make my life a bit easier, hopefully. Okay. Now, I could also take out the speaker. But that's maybe not the best idea. Maybe it's better just to desolder the speaker. So we have the red wire of the speaker is going here to this side. I'm just going to mark that. Um, so first thing I'm probably going to do is just change all the capacitors. Well, there's not a lot. There's only 10, I think. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So that's the first thing we'll do. And uh, yeah, the case is big enough. You see here there is a lot of room, so I have plenty of space to install a Bluetooth module in here. Um, let's see if my solder iron has already warmed up. I think it's also suffering from the cold weather. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's okay. But the wire is not coming off. Yeah, there it is. And the other one, okay. Now this should come out very easily actually, and it's all plastic. Um, let me put this case out of the way, see I don't break it. All right, so this is everything that's in there. You see um, right so what we can do is I'm gonna replace the caps we can have a look at the schematic as well but uh, let me first replace here and take my time replacing all the capacitors give everything a good clean and then I will get back to you okay so all capacitors have been replaced um, there were in fact 11, not 10. There was one hiding here underneath this ribbon cable. 
that guy over there. I didn't notice it at first, but um, it's also been replaced. The original ones, honestly, they tested not bad. Um, when I tested them in my ESR meter, most of them just, just tested okay. So, um, as expected, well, not really as expected, I expected the hum to go away um, with the changing of the capacitors, but that didn't happen. Let me um, show you here. So, this is when the radio is turned on, but yeah, I don't have an antenna, so it's normal that we don't really hear anything. It's working fine. Um, the switches are a bit twitchy, but um, maybe I'll need to clean those as well. But if I turn it off, then I think it's not as bad as it was. Let me get you a bit closer to the speaker here. I don't know if you picked that up, but there is still a hum in the uh, speaker. A very, very slight one. But it's still there, and if you look at the consumption while the radio is off... Um, see, it's consuming 2.5 watts right now. Um, or drawing 20 milliamps when it's turned off. Um, not sure if that is how it should be, but to me it doesn't really seem like it should be like that. Um, maybe let me quickly explain you how it is actually working the power supply. So here we got the power supply. Let me grab something to point here. Um, so we have the transformer on the separate board coming in over here. We have the rectifier the um, big filter capacitor, that is that one over there. It's a 2200 microfarad at 25 volts. And then here, this line is pulled low uh, or switched to chassis is the better uh, way to put it uh, when you turn on the radio because all the way here on the left, they drew the on off switch all the way over here, which is simply just switching one this line or that uh, pin to uh, to chassis or to ground so when you turn the radio on uh, this one goes to zero volt so the base of this transistor here t9 is pulled low uh, compared to the emitter here where the the full voltage from the rectifier is located so this um, transistor turns on that means that the output here or the collector is going high um, and this is a uh, NPN, so that one turns on but the base is positive. Um, so that means that when this guy turns on, this guy will also turn on and the yeah full voltage can pass through and the rest of the radius is powered basically. But that also means that, so this is a Ciclite pair, right? It's like a Darlington pair, uh, but with two um, different polarized transistors. Um, so, the thing here is that when the radio is off, these guys should be turned off. Um, and as you see here, the full power or the full uh, voltage, let's call it the B+, the full B+, is passed here through this diode, this one N4001, and powers here this chip. So this is the TDA1905, that's the uh, main amplifier chip. So on pin 2 we get the, um, yeah, the full main voltage, let's say, minus this diode drop, um, to power the amplifier. I can show you that. Um, this is ground. I'm gonna put it to voltage. And then I will probe here pin 2 of the amplifier chip very carefully that I don't short anything out. And um, let me... There it is. Wait. I'm using the wrong probe. 
there it is. See, we have 15.3 volts, which is actually a bit low compared to the 17 volts that they uh, prescribe. Now, um, if I turn off the radio, then you'd expect this sick light pattern to turn off fully. But if I now probe here pin 2 of the amplifier, I still get 1.3 volts. And it's not decreasing, so there is no capacitor bleeding down or anything. So if I go to this transistor over here, so that's the uh, this T8, so that's the second one here, that's the one which is passing um, the 17 volt. Then if I go to the emitter, so that's on the output side, see there I have this same 1.4 volt, if I turn it on, then this transistor switches on and I get the full 16 volts. But um, I'm not completely sure, but I think this transistor might be um, acting up a bit or might be leaky. I don't really know. Okay, so I got the transistor pulled and I hooked it up to my cheap Chinese tester here and look at this. Oh, it, now it says no unknown or damaged part. And just like a minute ago, it tested as a JFET. So <laughs> wait, let me do, I have a good connection here. Um, let's try that again. Oh no, now it, uh, it says that it cannot identify them. So <clears throat> yeah, I think it's bad. <laughs> Um, so that might explain why maybe why our voltage was low. Could it explain why our voltage was low? It can. Yes, it is. If it is leaky, it can explain why our voltage is low. It can definitely explain why the radio or the voltage doesn't shut shut off completely. Um, now, what is also interesting here is that it has a. If, I don't know if you can see this, but. Um, it has a um, ferrite bead, I think that is, on the base. That's quite interesting. The ferrite bead is also drawn on the schematic, so I'm just gonna put that on a new one. So I'm gonna replace this guy. This is a BC338. And um, if I check the data sheet correctly, it's, um, it can be replaced by a BC337. Uh, the BC337 is basically a higher rated, uh, yeah, it's the same transistor, but rated for a higher voltage. So it's a, an upgrade compared to the 338. And I have uh, the 337, um, yeah, I have a whole bunch of those in stock, uh, new still. So I'm just gonna swap that one out. Okay, so um, just to show you here, so this is the data sheet for the 337 and the 338, and the fact that they are in the same data sheet is, means that they are very similar transistors. Um, so they are available in different um, gain ranges. Now the one which came out of the radio and it's also written on the schematic is the PC338-25. So what is after the dash, so the 25 in this case, that's the gain range or the, the rating for the gain. And um, if we go to the um, yeah the ratings or the data sheet itself, then um, yeah when you want to swap a transistor with a different type of transistor, always check the specifications always just to see uh, if what you're swapping is uh, gonna work or not. And here you see that the three three seven has just higher maximum voltage ratings than the three three eight. See, so collector emitter voltage, the maximum rating is 45 compared to 25, and the collector base voltage is 50 compared to 30. And for the rest, all these um, specifications are the same, these parameters. Here, same thing, uh, breakdown voltages are higher on the 337 than on the 338. And all these specifications here, they are all identical between both types. So for the gain here, see the dash 25, the gain range, range is so the, the minimum gain, typical gain and maximum gain are 160, 250 and 400. So if you take a 337-25, 
you will have the same uh, ratings. Now, I do have here uh, 337-25s, so, um, and I have a lot of them, and these are, I bought these new, like, only a year ago. I bought a 50 of these because I needed them. Well, I needed some general purpose transistors and I bought these um, by accident, I guess. So that's a 337-25. So I'm gonna swap the um, the bead here, the ferrite bead, to the base of that one. And I'm gonna pull, put it in the radio and we'll see how it works. Okay, so I have everything hooked up again. Uh, the new transistor is in. Um, and let's see if something blows up or not. Yeah, the radio already still works. That's good. Do I hear a hum? Not much, I think. Um, let me measure the voltage here. So I'm gonna take ground again and the right probe. Um, let's... Um, let's measure here the emitter of the transistor that I just replaced. Look at that! It's... nothing! Collector, 22 volts, that used to be 16. Now we have nothing on the uh, collector um, emitter, sorry. And on the pin two of the IC here. Wow, okay, I just slipped. I have to be really, really careful with that. Absolutely nothing at all because yeah, you do have, a, that's why this diode is in there. I, I was wondering why that diode is in there. Um, so if you do have a slight bit of voltage there, then the diode drop is enough to put it on fully on zero. So see, this is one side of this diode, there we have two millivolts, and this is the other side, zero. So yeah, we have completely zero now on the power of the amplifier, so yay, that's fine. The But the radio is still drawing two watts. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, I don't think... Yeah, it's less because it used to be 2.2, 2.3. .2 now it's 2 watts. So, okay. Um, but at least we don't have this annoying hum anymore in the speaker when the radio is turned off. So that's quite nice. Okay, uh, alignment. Um, I don't know if we need to do much for the alignment. Um, I did remove the transformer from the... Uh, cabinet because it's quite a bit more easy to work on the radio like this instead of having this uh, half uh, piece of the cabinet uh, laying around here on the bench. Um, now I'm not gonna touch the FM for the moment I'm gonna start with the AM and see if it is out because um, yeah the FM is working really well and I don't want to mess it up so um, I'm just gonna do the AM here. Now the thing is, um, in the service or in the um, instructions, the service manual, the AM alignment instructions are missing. I think somebody forgot to scan them because you can see through the uh, the schematic, you can see them from the backside bleeding through. <laughs> so they were there, they were just forgotten to be scanned. So I printed these from the um, service manual of the RF425, which is, as I explained, um, the um, next model it's from a couple of years later, but it has the same chassis, so these alignment instructions should also apply. Now, they say here for the AM IF alignment, um, so they say select long wave, that's what I did, set the tuning scale pointer roughly to the middle of the dial, I did that as well. And the AF alignment should be done with the lowest possible voltage. Connect wobulator to C and oscilloscope to A. Now, um, so yeah, the wob wobulator is um, basically a sort of sweep generator. And um, I don't know if I have already shared this, but I actually acquired a wobulator recently. Let me show you here on the bench. There it is. 
uh, met de Grundig AS5, also from the 80s. And that's a RF frequency generator and wobulator, so we're gonna use that one. Um, and I have already have it hooked up. Now they say that you should connect it to the point C, which is over here in the long wave circuit. Um, and that you should connect your oscilloscope to point A, which is just after the detector. So this IC is doing the detection and from here on you have audio because here you have your tone control and your volume control and there's the amplifier. So that's the where you should connect your oscilloscope. And that's what I have done. So this is point A. I have the oscilloscope connected to that. And there is point C. And that's basically the long wave antenna. And I have the wobulator connected to that. Um, and this is the Y input of the scope. I have the scope set to XY mode. And the wobulator, um, the, yeah, how you should call it, the phase indication of the sweep or the, the, the trigger function, let's say, is connected here to the X um, axis of the XY mode. And then I have the oscilloscope set here to XY and I get here the IF um, on the on the screen in XY mode. It's working quite nicely now. It's the first time that I'm actually using this wobulator, so it took me <laughs> a while to figure out all the settings. I also have a marker, so I can enable the marker. I don't know if you can see this. Maybe let me just um, zoom you up a bit in on the scope screen. So let me enable the marker. And then see over there, so if I change the marker, you can see it moving around. So I do have a marker here that I can use. Um, it just deforms the signal a bit. So what I would like to do is I would uh, set the marker here to the center and then I dis disable it again. And then uh, we know that the marker here is set to the, yeah, the middle line. And now according to my um, mobulator, the marker is now set to 450.5 kilohertz. So um, that's about right. Now the thing is, this radio uses a ceramic filter, I believe, for the IF. And um, you're not able to set that center frequency anyway. See, so they say connect wobulator to point C and oscilloscope to point A, that's what we did. And then they say the center frequency of approximately 450 kilohertz is determined by the ceramic filter. See, there we have a ceramic filter. I guess that's the one they're talking about. So you're not able to set that anyway, but at least we could verify here that it's more or less okay. Then they say adjust the IF curve for maximum output and symmetry by alternately adjusting the green and yellow cores in the hybrid filter number one. So the hybrid filter number one, as shown here on the diagram, is, yeah, one is th this guy over here. So these two cores, uh, are the yellow and the green core and they are indeed yellow and green of the hybrid filter so if I twist these then that should have an effect on the on the band pass and we should adjust it for maximum output and also symmetry let's see if it does something yeah it's changing the filter or it's changing the band pass indeed now um, you could say this is a maximum, but that doesn't really look like a nice curve anymore. So actually I think where it was, was pretty good. Something like this. Let's check the other core. Oh. Yeah, see that was also set correctly. So I don't think we're gonna get a lot out of this. Um, you could gain a little bit of amplitude, but then your symmetry is, um, yeah, not great anymore. So I think I'm going to leave it at that. Then the next step is to say adjust circuit number two for maximum. And that's the third hole here in this row. So that's uh, this guy. 
And let's see if that changes something. Yeah, it does. Oh. Yeah, we got a bit out of that, but not a lot. We got a bit out of it, not much. Okay, so that's the IF alignment done. For the RF alignment, they say connect the signal generator to... So it took me, I don't know, an hour to set this up. And then, how long is this video? This video is already running for three minutes now. So let's say two minutes or three minutes to do the alignment. But yeah, every time you're using a device for the first time, like I'm now doing with my wobulator, it will take a while. Um, then for the RF alignment, connect the signal generator to the 75 ohm aerial socket. So that's the antenna socket over here um, repeat LC alignment several times ending with C alignment so repeat coil and capacitor alignment several times ending with the capacitor alignment only adjust trimmers in the same order as the numbering so then they are basically saying uh, yeah giving you the directions to um, yeah set the oscillator and the RF alignment so let me set this up and then we can see if the RF alignment is okay and if it is okay then I'm also not gonna touch it. Okay so I have the signal generator now set to 560 kilohertz and it's connected to the antenna input and uh, yeah it's spot on see let me just turn up the volume a bit so the, this is the center So this is the center and it's indeed exactly spot on 560 which has this um, mark here for alignment. So that's pretty good. Um, so I think the oscillator, I don't think we have to do anything. The aerial input circuit, maybe, I don't think so. Um, let's check the other side of the band, that's 1450. Let's put it here to 1450 my signal generator. Let's go to the other side of the band. Yeah, that's pretty good. You turn up the signal here a bit. See, it's um, just just slightly out. Maybe we can adjust that one. Let me see here. So it's a it's a two for maximum. And then the aerial is number seven. So um, two that's this guy and seven is uh, that guy. Um, I'm just gonna turn down the volume here a bit, but because um, so that should be this one. Let's double check before I touch something. I think I'm wrong. Yeah, it's this guy. It's the fork from the left here. Oh yeah. Uh, let's put it on the exactly on the dial here on the indicator let's twist this thing a bit there we have it that's nice and then number seven that's the first one from the left my signal just left the building um, <laughs> Yeah, by the way, I also turned off the lights here because these were get, getting a bit of interference on uh, AM. Um, let's adjust this guy. See if that makes a difference. Not really. Nope. Okay. Yeah, that was basically it. Let's go back to um, 
560 and see if that one didn't shift. No. This is the perfect position and that's the perfect sine wave, so that's good. Now let's do the same for long wave. Let's go to long wave and let's go to 160. So let me just set my signal generator here for 160. Almost there. Yeah, it's an analog uh, signal generator, so I, I cannot just type in the frequencies. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's more or less okay. Um, and on the other side is 270. That's not even marked on here. 270. Yeah, that's 270. Wow, that went fast. Yeah, see, that's also more or less okay. It's not even marked, so there is a mark for 275, but not for 270. That's fine. I'm gonna leave it. Okay, so I'm just checking the FM here, um, but um, I'm, I'm not gonna do anything about it because it's working perfect. And I'm more and more have the um, attitude of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, now, I connected the Wobulator like they um, prescribe in the instructions and I have nicely my S-curve here on the scope. What am I doing here? I'm just connecting it exactly as they uh, explain it. Where was it again? Um, so they say connect the oscilloscope to A, so that's the same point where we were before. And then um, connect the wobulator to the socket, to the, the um, antenna socket. So what I did is I put the dial here on something like 95 more or less. Because yeah, I f um, found a point where there was no station, and uh, I put it halfway in the middle between 94 and 96, so that's about 95. And then I set my wobulator here to uh, 95, and uh, I am actually uh, sweeping here now the RF, which is quite convenient, um, I must say. Because I was originally thinking about doing it on 10.7, but the alignment instructions here don't talk about uh, FM, IF. They only talk about supplying RF uh, frequencies. So then I checked, and indeed my wobulator can go to 120 megahertz, and it can um, wobble. <laughs> it can sweep the frequency on around 120. So I put the marker. So what you see here now is the marker frequency. Yeah, it works a bit weird. Um, when you select a band here to wobulate, then it um, yeah does a, a sweep in that in that band, and then you can determine the width of the sweep with uh, this dial. And it's not you don't know exactly what the width is. You just have to yeah there is a procedure to follow to have here the exact settings. But what is here on the dial is the marker frequency. So yeah it is drifting a bit because this device. It normally requires a long time to stabilize, so you need to operate it for a couple of couple of hours before it um, go, becomes very stable. I also don't know how super accurate it is. I think it's slightly off, but it's accurate enough for me. Um, it does need maybe a service, maybe it needs the capacitors changed, I don't know. But um, if you then uh, look at the scope, let me go back to the scope and let me zoom you in. So see, I have here my S-curve nicely on the screen and there is the marker. If I change the marker, you can see that this small dot will change. No, that's not the marker, that's the center frequency of my wobulator that I'm now changing. This is the marker. See, you can see it changing. If I put it right in the cross center, I have 95.05. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's close enough. And also the S-curve is really quite a nice shape. I don't think I need to adjust a lot here. And um, also, yeah, on the dial, if you look at the dial of the radio, then is it really 95 that I put it on? Or is it 95.05? I, I don't know. <laughs> so um, this accuracy, I think it's good enough. 
Um, I think the dial is correct and the detector is working perfectly fine, so I'm, I'm not going to touch it. If you do need to touch it, however, then there are alignment instructions in the service manual. But I again suggest you to download the service manual of the RF425-4625 because the alignment instructions in the manual of the RF100, they are all in German. And these ones, they do have the alignment instructions in English. Just pay attention that you follow the ones which are for the RF425 because the RF625, I think it uses... Um, a different method of yeah it, it has the presets I think and it's a different method of adjustment so ignore those parts unless you're aligning the RF625 obviously but um, see that's what they say here um, then you should uh, uh, which course you need to adjust and um, which things you need to adjust for symmetry of the F curve and everything and this part here is the alignment of the RF so the oscillator for um, for FM, but all these things they are they are perfectly fine, so I'm gonna leave them. Okay, um, I put the chassis back into the cabinet and I mounted here or I built my Bluetooth board um, and I switched it so that I can switch between input of the radio and um, the Bluetooth, and it also powers off the Bluetooth board when you are using the radio. Um, so where did I take these signals? Uh, first of all the power. I took the power from over here. So this is, was the transistor that we replaced earlier. Then you have, what, what, what did we have here? Um, something like 16 volts. Then after this transistor we have 9.3 volts. So I took that one because the Bluetooth board runs off 5 volts and I have a 7805 voltage regulator so the 17 volts would also have been fine but it's better to get closer to the 5 uh, because then this guy needs to drop less voltage and will get less hot so um, I took it from there that's the red and the cable the black one is just the chassis I soldered these here on the bottom of the board and then they go to the switch and um, this power is only made when the Bluetooth board is turned on or when yeah, uh, when this switch is turned on. Um, then where did I inject the audio? Well, here you have the amplifier and then you here have this small PCB. So this is one big PCB and there is a small PCB in the middle. That is that PCB over there. Um, and that's the tone control board. So you have here the tone control and the volume control. And I basically took off, took it off this this connection over here. So I, um, yeah, you could see that I took this pin, desoldered it, put the switch in between, and and connected it back to pin three. So then, depending on the position of this switch, you either get the radio signal switched through, or you get the signal from the Bluetooth board uh, switched into the tone control circuit. Um, right. Now I don't have an amplifier, um, mini amplifier here, so I just have the uh, Bluetooth board, so the volume will be a bit lower, slightly lower I guess, than the radio, but um, for the, the rest it should work fine. Um, so yeah, now I'm on FM, I don't have an antenna connected, but uh, see if I touch the... it's working quite well. Yeah, I'm not using <laughs> my body as an antenna, so it's not going to be perfect. But uh, let's switch to Bluetooth. See if I flick this switch. The radio cuts out. And the Bluetooth board powers up. And then let's connect here my tablet. I think it is already connected. Let's see. No, it's not. We are connected. Now let's play something. Ooh, so what shall we do? Ah, I have a nice ID. Um, Graham from Radio Cruncher is currently live streaming. So let's connect to that one. <laughs> let's turn up the volume all the way. 
And there we have Graham from Radio Cruncher. If you're not following his channel, it's very interesting. He um, broadcasts live every Sunday afternoon, uh, UK uh, time. So um, join us in the chat. It's quite fun, always. Um, so see. So I'm just going to put a little tiny drop of fader loop. It's working quite well. And now if I want to switch back to radio. There we have the radio again. So the only thing I still need to do now is mount this board. I'm probably going to mount it here towards the back of the cabinet and then I'm going to drill a hole for this switch. Um, I hope you forgive me for that one. I think you will because this radio is a quite simple one anyway. It's not super collectible and uh, the cabinet is yeah, gone already in a couple of places. It's, it's damaged quite badly in a couple of places. Also, turned off the power here. I cleaned up the entire cabinet, but there are some marks over here. See these spots? I don't know if you can see them. They look like dirt, but they are really not. Um, there is no way to clean them off. I even tried metal polish to polish them off, but they don't come off. So I think somebody must have spilled something chemical on here, which has damaged the surface of the plastic here. And there we have a couple of as well, see, these things. So um, it's not in perfect condition anyway. So an extra um, hole or so won't really make much of a difference. And then we will have Bluetooth. So let me do that and then we can have a look at the final result. So I think, Okay, here we are again and there is again football on the radio just as usual here in the weekend, on an evening. Um, yeah, let's turn that off again for a second because um, it's bloody annoying. Um, anyway, um, as you see, I've, I'm done basically. I put everything back in the cabinet. Um, now, I don't know if you can see it on the video, but the grill here doesn't look fantastic. Um, it's a bit cloudy and it looks like it's still dirty, but I really tried my best to clean it up and it has improved quite significantly, but it's still not perfect. So um, I might still work a bit on this um, afterwards, maybe try to clean it a bit better. Um, the only thing that would really solve it is to take it out and respray it, but yeah, you can take it out and it's quite easy to remove it, but I don't want to go to that extent with this, uh, with this radio. Um, I'm just going to try and clean it a bit better, but for the rest, um, we are done. So what I was just showing you this here is FM. So let me go quickly through the dial here. For some reason this station here at 108 is very silent compared to the other stations, but okay. Yeah, this, this uh, static here, I think that's my lamp, yeah, see? Let's do this without my uh, light activated here for a second. As you notice, it does mute the sound in between stations. See, the static uh, is just dropping quite significantly if you are not tuned to a station. Oh, it's also football, but in French. It's the same football, but in French. This, is, this station is, is... Ah, there it is. Okay, 
Okay, so it actually doesn't sound too bad um, for only this one speaker. So um, yeah, let's um, mm, classical music. Let's go to medium wave. Um, this is without my Winnie Whip, so just with the internal ferrite antenna, and I have to say it receives quite well um, for only using this internal antenna. <laughs> Indian meals provided on most tours and Schengen visa services available. Call Mantra Holidays on 0203. Yeah, there is a lot of fading on AM, but that's normal. It's actually quite impressive for an internal antenna. It's again football, but now in Spanish. <laughs> oh, oh no, in is this Portuguese? Yeah, I think it's Portuguese. Yeah, this is the this is Spanish football. So we now already had football in three languages, in four languages. Okay, so let's say uh, long wave. There will be nothing, uh, not a lot on there, and I will have to turn up the volume quite a bit to hear something. And I expect only BBC4 with the internal antenna. Ooh, nothing at all. Really? That's weird. I was receiving long wave like half an hour ago, but now nothing. Okay. Nothing on long wave. Let's go back to FM. No. Here in the back we have the Bluetooth switch. Um, it's I think it's quite okay. Um, no, this was the only double pole switch that I still had uh, in my stock, so uh, it had to be this one. Um, the disadvantage is that if you would bump the radio into something, then it might crack the uh, the back. The advantage is that you can easily feel it when you're reaching or in the back side of the radio. Maybe if I, I maybe I'll buy a more ro low profile switch in the future at some point, but for now this is okay. So let's see. Uh, let's show you how it works. So I'm listening to FM and I flick the switch. Now you do have the FM bleeding through very, very slightly in the background. And if you want to avoid that, then yeah, you have to tune out of, this, out of a station because then you don't have anything um, on the... Or you have to tune to long wave, then you also don't have anything. <laughs> um, 
now let's connect the Bluetooth here. Um, Okay, so there we have it. Um, this was a fun project and it's a nice looking radio, simple radio which had a very rough life and um, which will now be given at least a bit of extra life uh, because it will be more useful with FM and Bluetooth and um, don't know yet what I will do with it but um, it will at least see some use again. So I'd like to thank you for watching. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, I hope I'll see you in the next one. Take care. Bye bye.